Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, presentation by Professor Lawrence White. Larry's an old friend of ours. Uh, he's been and participated in CIS events some years ago. He almost got a job at the Australian National University, and uh, we're quite sorry that he didn't. Currently, he's Professor of Economics at George Mason University. He specialises in the theory and history of banking and money, and is best known for his work on free banking. He received his AB from Harvard and his MA and PhD from the University of California, Los Angeles. He previously taught at New York University, University of Georgia, and the University of Missouri, St. Louis. He is the author of Clash of Economic Ideas, uh, The Theory of Monetary Institutions, Free Banking in Britain, uh, Competition and Currency, and the editor of F.A. Hayek, who stares at us from here, The Pure Theory of Capital, and various other books. His articles on monetary theory and banking history have appeared in the American Economic Review, the Journal of Economic Literature, the Journal of Money, Credit and Banking, and other leading professional journals. In 2008, he received the Distinguished Scholar Award of the Association for Private Enterprise Education. He's been visiting professor at Queen's University Belfast, visiting fellow at the Australian National University, visiting research fellow and lecturer at the American Institute for Economic Research, uh, visiting lecturer at the Swiss National Bank, and a visiting scholar at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. He co-edits a book series for Routledge, Foundations of the Market Economy. He is co-editor of Economic Journal Watch, and host by monthly podcast for EJW Audio. He's a member of the Board of Associate Editors of the Review of Austrian Economics and a member of the editorial board of the Cato Journal. He is a contributing editor to the Foundation for an Economic Education magazine, uh, The Freeman, and lectures at the Foundation's annual seminar in advanced Austrian economics. He is an adjunct scholar of the Cato Institute and a member of the Academic Advisory Council of the Institute of Economic Affairs. So, so it's my great pleasure to ask Larry to come and speak to us tonight about his new book. Thanks, Greg, and thank you all for coming out on this uh, rainy evening. Uh, so there's the cover. I didn't design it, so don't hold that against me. Some people tell me it looks very 70s-ish. <laughs> so it's kind of an ambitious book. I try to cover the history of economic thought, but only the good parts, uh, the parts that are policy relevant. Uh, and uh, the, featuring the economic history of the last hundred years as the context within which these big debates took place. Uh, so it begins with a description of sort of the state of play as of a hundred years ago, where contrary to uh, some myth that all economists were laissez faireists a hundred years ago. I find that it's not true. That, in fact, is the middle of what in the US was the progressive era, but also in Britain and in Europe was a time of uh, economists becoming, uh, many economists, advocating a much larger role for government. So there has been a debate between two sides, uh, at least, for a long time. I, I don't have time to go through the entire book, so I'm going to focus on the second half. That's why I bolded the uh, chapters toward the end. So let's start at the low point of the 20th century, and then we can end on a slightly more positive note. <laughs> uh, maybe some of you have seen this uh, rap video in which Hayek and Keynes go at each other in verse. Uh, that can sort of serve as a summary for the first half of the 20th century. <laughs> I, I talk about the business cycle views of Keynes and Hayek and, and how they opposed each other. Um, and I like to think of that part of the book as kind of a compendium to this video. And the reason I say that is this video has had more than three million hits. So if everybody who watches the video would buy my book, <laughs> you can do the math. But let's start at the low point uh, of the last hundred years. So these are two SS agents uh, who came to visit the German economist Wilhelm Repke. Uh, Repke was a classical liberal who had been giving speeches criticizing uh, the economic ideas of the Nazis. And the two SS agents, uh, he had already been dismissed from his uh, post as a professor at Marburg University for having these views, but he kept giving speeches. And so the SS agents were there to suggest to him that he should stop uh, making these criticisms. And if he did, maybe he could have his job back. And Repka recalls uh, denouncing the agents in no uncertain terms and telling them to get lost. Uh, 
And after they left his apartment and he shut the door behind them, he said to himself, maybe I'd better leave the country, <laughs> uh, which he did, and he spent the rest of the war in uh, Istanbul. Uh, but this is the way I open the chapter. I, I try to open each chapter with a sort of illustrative vignette uh, on the Second World War. And the important debate that comes out of the Second World War uh, is focused on Hayek's book, The Road to Serfdom, a warning about the methods of uh, central planning which had been used for war mobilization, which many uh, thinkers, many politicians, and even some economists thought should be continued in peacetime. And Hayek was warning against this and warning against the uh, mistaken notion. The book actually began as a, a memo that Hayek wrote for the head of the LSE, Beveridge. Beveridge thought that uh, Nazism was some kind of pro-capitalist movement, sort of the last ditch uh, pro-capitalist movement, uh, because they uh, were politically opposed to the Marxists in Germany. And, and Hayek said, no, no, he wrote this memo trying to explain to Beveridge that these are two different kinds of socialism, but they're both kinds of socialism. Right? It is the National Socialist Worker and Workers' Party. Uh, but uh, The Road to Serfdom was a, a book that made Hayek famous. Uh, it was condensed and put in the Reader's Digest in the United States, which was a big deal. The Reader's Digest in those days had 7 million readers, 7 million subscribers. And, uh, you know, it was in every dentist's office across the country, so who knows how many more millions of readers. Uh, and there's a recent edition uh, that Bruce Caldwell has edited that has a lot of interesting uh, material, including this memo and an intermediate version in the form of an article and then an annotated version of the book. Uh, this is uh, selling a little bit better than my book uh, on Amazon, but, uh, I mean, it's been number one on the economic theory list. Uh, for a long time, but I'm hoping that we can uh, move a little closer. Uh, so after the war, there's an important election in Great Britain where the Labour Party uh, wins the election. It's Clement Attlee, and the, the head of the Labour Party uh, is an academician, academician uh, named Harold Lasky. Harold Lasky is a professor of political science at the LSE and actually has an office not too far from Hayek's. Uh, and during the election, uh, Lasky is making controversial statements and angering Attlee. He's, Lasky's talking about, you know, maybe we can learn something from the Soviet Union, and maybe Stalin's not so bad. And uh, Lasky sends him a famous memo which says, a period of silence from you would be appreciated. <laughs> uh, after the election, uh, Attlee holds a press conference in which he says, look, uh, I know Professor Lasky has, is the uh, leader of the Labor Party, but I'm in charge now. And the New York Times ran the following headline, which I love, Britain not ruled by intellectuals. <laughs> right? The politicians are going to run things, not Professor Lasky. Uh, but Lasky was a, a famous member of uh, the Fabian Society. The Fabian Society provided many of the ideas that uh, Attlee's administration put into effect, in particular, the nationalization of industries. So here's a list of the industries they nationalized. They also continued the wartime rationing. Uh, well, it, it varied from product to product, but f for several more years after the war and for a decade after the war for some things like coal. Uh, within the Labor Party at this time, there was a kind of a battle for control of economic policy between uh, the Keynesians, like James Mead, who thought that the government should provide a kind of overall guidance to the aggregates in the economy, make sure there was enough investment in total, but not try to direct in any uh, detail where the investment went, and those who did want to direct in detail where the investment went. They actually called themselves the Goss Planners. <laughs> Uh, after the Soviet planning agency. Uh, Mead's group was known as the thermostatters, because their view was you just adjust the thermostat. You don't have to uh, intervene. And fortunately, uh, they predominated. Uh, this is a picture of Mead actually in front of uh, a hydraulic model representing the Keynesian model of the economy. 
it's got actual pumps and sluices, and uh, he's quite happy about it. Uh, so I, I go into the uh, ideas of the Fabian Society. So in this chapter, as in many other chapters, a lot of the story is told in flashbacks. And in the uh, introduction to the book, I say, please don't think of the book as having a scrambled chronology. Think of it as uh, Tarantino-esque. It's like one of Quentin Tarantino's movies where events don't, aren't really presented to you in chronological order because it's actually better to tell the story sometimes in flashbacks. Uh, of course, there's not quite as much uh, bad language in my book as in Tarantino's. And uh, I, I say in the introduction that there's not as much bloodshed either, but then someone pointed out to me, you do talk about the Soviet Union, so <laughs> maybe you should count it as bloodshed. But these are the uh, leading lights of the Fabian Society, uh, Beatrice and Sidney Webb, and then uh, George Bernard Shaw on the right. Shaw, of course, is the most famous as a playwright, but he actually wrote more words as a socialist pamphleteer than he did as a playwright. Uh, one of the, the f things that put the Fabian Society on the map was this collection of essays, Fabian Essays on Socialism. But they continued to churn out policy pamphlets for many decades, offering incremental changes uh, in, in the rules, in the legislation to nationalize this, impose minimum standards for that, cap the number of work hours, and so on. Uh, I was just in Melbourne this morning, and there's a monument near the hotel I stayed in last night to the eight hours movement uh, in Australia. That was one of the Fabian's ideas. So this is Walter Eucken. Uh, so now we're starting the next chapter, uh, which is not on the Fabian Society, but on the Mont Pelerin Society and the rebirth of what I ch finally came to call Smithian political economy. Uh, Walter Eucken was uh, sitting on a bench in a small town in Switzerland eating an orange and people observed this and, and recorded it. Uh, he was eating this orange with great, great delight, right? it's sort of a simple thing. And why was he eating it with great delight? Uh, he was eating it with great delight because unlike Repka, he had spent the war in Germany and he, there were no oranges in Germany, at least if you weren't in the elite, if, if you weren't part of the ruling. Uh, elite. So this was the first time he had been out of Germany and the first time he'd had an orange in many, many years. So he was enjoying the, literally, the fruits of a market economy uh, rather than a planned economy. Uh, Eucken became important as an advisor to uh, Ludwig Erhard, who I'll talk about in a minute. But he was in this small town in Switzerland uh, because it was the first meeting of the Mont Pelerin Society, what came to be known as the Mont Pelerin Society after the name of the Swiss town where they met. Uh, so here's a map with a picture of where the indication of where the Mont Pelerin is. It's on the north shore of Lake Le Mans. Uh, here's, uh, uh, this is Frank Knight, Milton Friedman, and uh, George Stigler at the meeting. There's Hayek at the lower left addressing the meeting and uh, Ludwig von Mises and Karl Popper. So these were all the luminaries of uh, the class, what remained of the classical liberal intelligentsia uh, from across the world. And Hayek's idea was we should sort of rally the troops. There are just a few people in each country who have kind of become isolated and lots of international ill feeling during the war we need to overcome. But more than that, we need a way of getting critical feedback on our ideas where we don't have to start from first principles, where there's a lot of shared understanding. And then we can talk about um, the higher level issues of how to restore a free society. Uh, it was not really the counterpart to the Fabian Society, though, because the Mont Pelerin Society uh, at Hayek's insistence, never embarked on a program of issuing pamphlets calling for this or that concrete reform. It was uh, for the discussion among the members at sort of a higher level of intellect, uh, intellectual uh, discourse. But it became uh, the task of institutions like the Center for Independent Studies and other think tanks around the world, uh, many of them in connection with members of the Mont Pelerin Society or directed by members of the Mont Pelerin Society to put practical proposals forth and uh, 
operate at a less rarefied uh, level of intellectual uh, abstraction. So we're flashing through, but uh, I don't want to take uh, more than my allotted time. Uh, so here's Germany at the end of the war. Uh, it's divided into four occupation zones, and the U.S. and British zones were later merged to form something called the Buy Zone. This picture is from a movie I highly recommend called Germany Year Zero by the Italian director Roberto Rossellini. Uh, and the picture you see is of a boy who's uh, the protagonist in the film, and he's scrounging for food. This was actually filmed uh, in the rubble of post-war Berlin. And he's scrounging for food because the occupation authorities had kept in place the price controls that the Nazis had had in place since before the war. And as you know, price controls create shortages. There wasn't enough food. People had ration coupons, but the ration coupons actually didn't give you enough calories to live on. So people were bartering anything they had left uh, to try to get enough food. And actually the cities were partly depopulated by people moving to the countryside to be closer to where they could barter for food. Uh, well, it just so happens, or through a fortuitous circumstance, that uh, the buy zone, the British US buy zone, uh, had an economic director who was Ludwig Erhard. Ludwig Erhard, a very staunch free market economist, uh, in, very much influenced by Eucken and by Repke, who had also stayed in Germany during the war. Uh, and he becomes the economic policy director of this buy zone. And uh, June 20th is the date at which he's supposed to announce that they're going to replace the feeble old uh, Reichsmark, which sort of wasn't good for anything because all the goods were rationed anyway, but had lost almost all of its purchasing power during the war, uh, they're going to replace it with the new Deutsche Mark. But uh, the general in charge of the occupation zone, General Lucius Clay, gets word that at the same time uh, Erhard's going to go on the radio to announce the currency uh, switch, he's also going to announce, without any pri previous authorization from the occupation authority, a price decontrol. He's going to remove the price controls on many, many goods, uh, not all of them right away, but many of them, and eliminate the uh, ration system on those goods. Uh, this, by the way, was something that uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, who was present as an advisor to the U.S. State Department, said will never work. There's no question that we need to keep planning the German economy. The only question is the details of the planning, but there's, there's no chance of getting recovery by any talk about decontrol. And throughout the book, John Kenneth Galbraith turns up in the wrong place with the wrong advice. <laughs> this is just an example. In the next chapter, he's going to turn up in India uh, with the wrong device about how to have the uh, Indian economy grow. So uh, the phone rings in Erhard's office, and it's uh, General Clay on the line. And he says, uh, Professor Erhard, he wasn't a professor, but Dr. Erhard, uh, my advisors tell me that you're about to make a big mistake. And Erhard says, oh, that's OK. My advisors tell me the same thing. <laughs> but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, and he did it, and it wasn't a big mistake. It was a huge success. Suddenly, goods appeared as if from out of the woodwork. Things that people had been hoarding, they could now sell in the market. Uh, and so fruits and vegetables suddenly started appearing from the countryside. Uh, further decontrols were instituted. Tax rates were cut, uh, and as observers described at the time, the factories suddenly started belching smoke, and the clatter of construction crews could be heard throughout the cities. So it was a remarkable turnaround, and the, the next couple decades of, of vigorous economic growth in Germany became known as the wonder economy, or the Wirtschaft of Wunder. Very different story in India. So these two chapters kind of uh, form a pair. In India, they turned away from the market. Uh, I like this cartoon, but it, it takes a little explaining. Uh, this is Gandhi on the rope uh, heading out up to cloud cuckoo land. And his economic ideas were a bit uh, dreamy, shall we say. Uh, his view was that India had been exploited by the British giving trade monopolies, uh, the India, East India Company and so on. Uh, 
so the solution to avoid being exploited by international trade was to eliminate international trade. And India should become self-sufficient at a national level. And not only that, but it should become self-sufficient at the village level. Uh, and the, the Gandhian flag for India had a spinner's wheel in the middle because cloth production was going to move back into the villages. Now, uh, I put an early draft of this chapter online, and I, I received an email from uh, someone in India who said, no, no, you're caricaturing Gandhi's views. He didn't believe in complete abolition of international trade. He thought it was okay if India imported things that could not possibly be produced in India. So he was okay with the importation of oatmeal, uh, for example. I said, okay, I, I amended the chapter. Uh, but on the left is Nehru. Uh, I'm not sure entirely who he's arguing with, but Nehru forms a central figure in this chapter because he becomes the prime minister, Gandhi leaves the governing to him, and he's a socialist. He's actually studied at the University of Cambridge uh, where he picked up Fabian ideas, uh, heard lectures by the leading Fabians, including George Bernard Shaw, uh, later writes Shaw a letter saying, you know, I learned a lot from your lecture. Uh, here's a lecture by John Maynard Keynes too, but that's a different story. So the, the chapter actually begins with the following uh, story. Uh, the economist Peter Bauer, who is famous as a skeptic uh, of what used to be traditional development theory, in fact, his most important book is called Descent on Development. Uh, Bauer visits India for the first time. I believe it was 1956. And he goes to the uh, British High Commission, which is still operating in Delhi, uh, without quite the same authority, but they're advising on India's development <laughs> efforts. And he says, does anybody here know how I can get in touch with an economist named B.R. Shinoy? And the reason he wants to get in touch with B.R. Shinoy is that the, uh, when Nehru decided that they should institute Soviet-style five-year plans in India, uh, it's not exactly a Soviet economy, of course, because it's still uh, largely private-owned, but uh, Shinoy, uh, sorry, the, the government appoints a panel of economists to give them some feedback on, the, on this plan. Uh, and of 21 economists on the panel, Shinoy is the only one who says it's a bad idea. He writes a famous note of dissent. The other 20 economists say, yeah, this is great. This is how we're going to move forward. We're going to have government lead the industrialization effort. And Shinoy's view is it's a little too soon for industrialization, our comparative advantages in agriculture. Why would you want to waste scarce capital uh, building steel factories? All right, we can import steel more cheaply than we can make steel. Uh, well, this note of dissent makes Shinoy completely persona non grata among the leaders of the development effort, the, the planning institute, the statistical institute, uh, Nehru's government, and even at the international uh, foreign embassies who are eagerly participate or enthusiastically participating in the planning effort. So when uh, Bauer goes to the High Commission and says, can you put me in touch with uh, Shinoy, uh, the official he talks to says, I'm sorry, we don't have any time for acknowledged madmen. Uh, Shinoy was so far out of the mainstream at that time. But the uh, Western government sent lots of advisors who said planning is a, is a fine idea, including Galbraith, who I mentioned before, but a long list of luminaries from Cambridge and Oxford and MIT um, and other leading institutions in the West. And on the other side, uh, the Eisenhower administration sends Milton Friedman. <laughs> um, and Friedman writes a very interesting memo on uh, India, making basically Shinoy's arguments uh, in a little more detail. And there's Bauer, who uh, are skeptical of this effort to do things that are not consistent with India's comparative advantage. Right? They're going to be wasting resources producing things that it would be cheaper to buy. Uh, so I go on to discuss that debate in more detail. So now let's move to uh, post-war monetary reconstruction and uh, the Bretton Woods meeting in uh, New Hampshire in 1944, where the leader of the British delegation is John Maynard Keynes. Uh, Keynes is 61, I believe. He's still, he's a little bit battered. 
but he's still intellectually vigorous and he's kind of an economic policy rock star. Uh, everybody there talks about what a impression he made on them. Everybody who's written memoirs about the meeting. Uh, Harry Dexter White, no relation, is a uh, leader of the American delegation. And the plan that emerges is actually more, has more details uh, that White uh, proposed rather than what Keynes completely wanted because the U.S. government had uh, IOUs from all the European governments, so they, they kind of had some leverage. Uh, there's a little ditty that I quote in the, in the book. Uh, in Washington, Lord Halifax whispered to Lord Keynes, they have all the money bags, but we have all the brains. Uh, Halifax was the British ambassador to the U.S. So they, they uh, came up with this system which was going to give more freedom to central banks to conduct discretionary monetary policy. That was the thrust of it. Certainly more than the classical gold standard had or the sort of half-hearted gold standard of the interwar years. And uh, Harry Dexter White was having a press conference every day at 3 p.m. to sort of brief the media on what was going on at this conference and how wonderful it was going to be. And one day, Keynes uh, uh, makes a guest appearance at the conference, and the journalists are very eager to hear what he has to say. As, as I said, he was uh, very famous. And Keynes says, well, what we're going to do is we're going to no longer allow the gold standard to be an uncontrolled tyrant over the world's monetary system. We're going to reduce it to the role of a constitutionally limited monarch. And this is really pretty cheeky when you think about it, <laughs> since the gold standard is what kept central banks from behaving with arbitrary discretion. But that constraint is going to be weakened, and it's weakened to the point where, uh, well, it, the system falls apart. Uh, it, and famously, in uh, economic thought, there are three objectives. You can only pursue two of them. Uh, one is to have an independent central bank. Uh, the second is to have fixed exchange rates. And the third is to allow free trade and capital flows. And for the first decade of Bretton Woods, there wasn't free trade and capital flows. Most countries still had capital controls left over from the war and it took a long time to eliminate them. But once they were eliminated, then the other two goals come into conflict because if a country is pursuing an independent monetary policy, then it can raise its price level to a point where its goods are more expensive than goods in another country at the fixed exchange rate. And so if you let people trade all the currency they want, all the money is going to flow out of the high-priced country into the low-priced country. And at that point, you have an exchange rate crisis. And so the Bretton Woods system began limping from exchange rate crisis to exchange rate crisis. Some countries had to devalue. Some had to revalue. Finally, the United States, which was the only country with an obligation to redeem in gold, issues so much in U.S. Uh, dollars that they can no longer redeem them for gold. They flood the world with dollars. And European governments begin to uh, say, yeah, we think uh, we're better off getting the gold than continuing to hold the dollars. And the U.S. sort of cajoled them by saying, NATO, you know, we're providing this defense for you. But finally, France said, no, we'll, we'll quit NATO and we'd like our gold, please. Uh, and at that point, Richard Nixon had to close the gold window. And this is an actual frame from his television address where he blamed speculators for all the trouble. Uh, couldn't possibly blame U.S. monetary policy for all the trouble. But fundamentally, his choice was stop inflating or end the link to gold. And he said, let's end the link to gold. Uh, and so the, the system went off the gold standard. Now, one of the people applauding this move at the time uh, was the economist Milton Friedman, uh, who we just saw at Mont Pelerin. And Friedman's hope was that we could get a better constraint on monetary policy than the gold standard. Of course, that didn't happen, and Friedman later regretted that. But uh, the rela relaxation of the constraints just helped inflation go even higher. Uh, eventually, we get to double-digit inflation. And we, when we get to that point, uh, Friedman becomes uh, famous because he's got a theory, the quantity theory of money, uh, he and his followers revived the quantity theory of money, which explains inflation. The prevailing macroeconomic theory at the time, Keynesian economics, couldn't explain inflation. Keynesian models typically either took the price level as just given, 
<laughs> or they had a Phillips curve, right? A Phillips curve said the price level will go up if and only if the unemployment rate is low. Uh, and that seemed to be okay in the 1960s, but when inflation really got going, suddenly inflation was going up and unemployment was going up. So we were off the Phillips curve, and this was a crisis uh, in Keynesian economics. Uh, the chapter begins with the following story. Milton Friedman, uh, in 1970, when Arthur Burns, who's on the right, is appointed head of the Federal Reserve System, uh, Friedman was a columnist for Newsweek magazine, and he writes a glowing column. Burns was actually Friedman's mentor when Friedman was a student, uh, his professor at Rutgers and uh, uh, his advisor. And Friedman writes this glowing column saying, Arthur Burns is a great appointment, and he knows what to do, and I'm sure that he will constrain money growth in order to keep inflation down. Uh, that was in February. By May, <laughs> Burns has given several speeches saying, we don't know what's happening. The economy's not working the way it's supposed to because the Phillips curve is not uh, being observed. And it's breaking down. And so he blamed everything under the sun uh, for inflation except money growth. All right, so now Friedman had a choice. He could be uh, sort of true to his ideas or he could save his friendship with Arthur Burns. He wrote Burns uh, some very sharply worded letters, uh, or private letters, saying, you know, you should stop saying this nonsense. <laughs> and eventually he went public with it, and reportedly they were never close friends again. Uh, but the truth was more important to Friedman than uh, his friendship with Arthur Burns. Uh, 13th chapter tries to get a handle on the growth of government in the post-war period, probably the most uh, single most important event. And in some ways, the entire book is about the battle between more government and less government. Uh, but it begins with the following story, uh, because the, the, the two most important theories for talking about the size of government uh, in modern economics are public goods theory, which suggests that what government does is provide things that people uh, really want but can't get through market mechanisms because of market failures. Public goods uh, as a sort of a technical term, meaning goods that sort of have to be provided to everybody together. It can't be sold to on a user pays basis. The alternative is public choice theory, which says, no, there's a logic to govern, an economic logic to government that has to do with the costs and benefits uh, to elected officials and bureaucrats and voters, but it's not according to some blackboard theory of uh, public goods. But uh, Ronald Coase is the famous critic of public goods theory. Uh, he publishes an article on the Federal Communications Commission, which is a, a regulatory agency in the U.S. that's in charge of deciding who gets to broadcast and who doesn't. So they give out licenses. And Coase makes the argument that, you know, really, uh, you should just sell off property rights uh, in bandwidth, and then you can reach an efficient allocation of resources. And just as an aside, he sketches this idea that if you have well-defined property rights, it really doesn't matter to whom you give the uh, property ownership, the property titles, they'll end up uh, in the hands of the people who can use them the most uh, efficiently. And so you'll end up with an efficient mix of different radio formats uh, run by people who actually know how to run radio stations because the resources will go to the highest bidders eventually. Um, and the University of Chicago Economics Department can't believe this idea that no matter who you start out with giving the titles to, you'll get to the same efficient allocation of resources. They're convinced that Coase has to be wrong. Uh, he publishes this article in the Journal of Law and Economics, which is edited at the University of Chicago by Aaron Director. Uh, but he ha there's a lot of skepticism, and the rest of the department wants to set Coase straight, and Coase knows that they want to set him straight. So he asked director, can you set up a dinner party at which we can uh, hash out this issue? So uh, director invites him to his house together with 20 members uh, of the Chicago Economics Department and some of them from the business school. And at the beginning of the dinner, it's kind of a strange dinner party, <laughs> Uh, where they're going to have this discussion. But at the beginning, it's 20 to 1 against Coase. <laughs> and at the end, it's 21 to 0 in favor of Coase. So it's quite a dramatic change in thinking. 
Um, and uh, George Stigler writes an account of what happened there. He said, uh, as usual, Milton Friedman did most of the talking <laughs> and most of the thinking. <laughs> Uh, and Kosa's account is very similar. He said that mostly I had to answer questions from Friedman. He said, you know, Friedman's very tough. He's fair, but he's very tough. He won't let you slip up. But I knew that when after an hour Friedman hadn't knocked me out, that I was pretty much home. Because <laughs> if Friedman can't knock you out in an hour, uh, your argument must be sound. Uh, so I go on to explain exactly what the Kosa's argument is and how it relates to the problem of externalities uh, and public goods. Uh, but, you know, here's a, a kind of picture of how government has grown in the post-war period. That's the thing that really needs to be explained. So the, the public goods explanation is that as economies grow wealthier, people want more of these goods that only government can provide. And the public choice explanation is, no, you need to look at the way the political system works, and you'll get a very different idea and a very different um, – moral, I guess, about uh, what we're observing. So, and of course, Hayek uh, in law legislation and liberty is very much informed by public choice and tries to argue how in a democracy where the legislature is not constrained, they can give any favor to anyone, uh, you tend to get a sort of expansion beyond what anybody in a reflective frame of mind who wasn't sort of lobbying for his own narrow interest uh, would agree to. You get a sort of incoherent system where everybody's, in Bastiat's words, trying to live at the expense of everybody else. Okay, uh, we're almost home. Uh, next to last chapter is on the debate over free trade, and so I have this picture of Friedman wearing his Adam Smith necktie because Friedman was called to testify between, before something called the U.S. Deficit Commission which was investigating why there were chronic trade deficits in the United States. And uh, he shows up wearing an Adam Smith necktie, and one of the commissioners notices this and says to him, I see you're wearing an Adam Smith necktie. And Friedman says, yes, yes, you know, Adam Smith told us that uh, it makes more sense to buy goods than to uh, produce them ourselves when it's cheaper to import them. And uh, the commissioner says, well, what do you think Adam Smith would have thought about the World Trade Organization? <laughs> And Friedman, uh, you know, without missing a beat, says, well, uh, I think that we're better off unilaterally reducing our trade barriers than to wait uh, until we can get partial agreement to reduce them a little bit. But this idea that you're better off unilaterally reducing your trade barriers has been very difficult to sell. I mean, this is what the theory of comparative advantage tells us, but it's been a very difficult sell throughout the years. And I in the chapter, go back to Adam Smith and his argument for that proposition. And the opposition to it, and the most sophisticated version of the opposition is what's called the infant industry argument. So I talk about why, well, how the critics of the infant industry argument have made their case, and I think pretty convincingly, right? uh, but I won't go into those details now. But uh, here's the sort of the gist of the idea. Uh, it was once expressed uh, reportedly by Joan Robinson, although it's hard to believe she actually said this since she was a Marxist. Uh, the argument for protectionism is like the argument that if my trading partner is putting rocks in his harbor, we should put rocks in our harbor too. <laughs> right? So it's like an anti-dredging policy. Okay, last chapter, I try to bring it up to the present by talking about the sovereign debt crisis uh, in Europe and to some extent in the United States. And this is George Tavlis from the uh, Bank of Greece. He appeared at a monetary conference in Washington, D.C. a couple of years ago, a uh, Cato Institute conference. And he begins his remarks by saying, well, it's great to be in the United States. You know, more than ever, it reminds me of home. <laughs> and there the audience laughed a little bit more nervously. <laughs> Uh, but Greece, of course, had go uh, was already in the throes of a sovereign debt crisis where the interest rate on Greek sovereign debt had spiked upward to above 12%. Uh, a few months later, Ireland found itself in the same situation. Uh, the background is a little different. Greece had been running chronic deficits for years. Ireland was doing okay. It only had a debt ratio of 
in 2007, but then because of the global financial crisis, a couple of their largest banks failed and they decided to bail them out. And the banks were so large relative to the government budget that they ran a deficit of 31% one year. And in no time, the deficit, the, sorry, the debt ratio was up to 97% of GDP. And the bond market looked at this and said, we don't like this trajectory. <laughs> Uh, we think there's a much lower chance you're going to be able to pay us back all that money. Uh, so yields skyrocketed on uh, Irish bonds. Now, in the U.S., interest rates are still low, but the debt is at present climbing like a rocket. Uh, it started climbing like a rocket during the financial crisis, during the recession. That This is the shaded area at the end here. Uh, but it climbed more than can be accounted for just by the shortfall in tax revenues. It also climbed because of additional spending, uh, the stimulus program, for example. Uh, and it's continued to climb since recovery has begun. Right? We're in the non-shaded area now, which means officially it's in a recovery. It's a slow recovery. It's a weak recovery. But it is a recovery, so you think that the deficit ought to come down a bit the debt should stop growing at 10% a year. Uh, you have to worry about, I do at least, uh, about that trajectory. Yesterday in the Financial Review, I tore out this article. I don't know if the camera can see it. The headline says, France must cut to avoid debt spiral. All right, so France is being warned that it's now in this situation where if they keep borrowing at the rate they're at, their public sec uh, sector debt is 90% of GDP now and rising. Uh, that they w are in danger of the bond market saying, well, now you have to pay us more because there's a higher risk of default. Uh, so to avoid that, you have to take some serious measures to cut the size of the deficit. So it's basically a matter of arithmetic <laughs> that calls for, what's, uh, for recognizing the budget constraint. But recognizing the facts has become no now known by the ugly label of austerity. Right? So you must believe in pain and suffering if you want to recognize the facts, the facts that you can't live beyond your means forever. And in a world where you're trying to sell bonds, uh, it, the day of reckoning can come sooner rather than later. Right? When you're trying to roll over a large portion of your debt every year, you can start paying more and more debt service very quickly until the debt service, uh, if you're on this kind of trajectory, will come to consume the entire budget. Now, uh, how did we get into this situation where the, the budget, uh, the debt mounted and mounted? If I go back, you see that it's chronically rising. And there is a brief lull during the Clinton years and then rising again even before it takes off like a rocket. And that uh, I attribute to what I call fiscal Keynesianism. It's not really in Keynes's general theory, but it's developed by his followers in the U.S. and elsewhere, especially Alvin Hansen uh, at Harvard. But here's a statement by a different Harvard economist, the one I actually took freshman economics from, uh, Otto Eckstein, and I'm sorry I couldn't find a picture of him. There apparently is no photo of him on the Internet. But uh, the Harvard Crimson, the student newspaper, had run an op-ed piece by him, and on their website this was the picture they have available. Uh, Here's a statement he makes expressing the Keynesian view, the fiscal Keynesian view. Uh, what about debt incurred during periods of unemployment? And this is unusually uh, frank in that he's admitting that deficits do create debt. <laughs> there, there is a re some residual, some residuum. Uh, he says, well, look, it's not a problem because uh, if you're not at full employment, then the resources that you're taking up would have been idle. So in a sense, there's no cost to putting those things to work. They would have been doing nothing. Uh, in fact, it's better than a free lunch because the spending by the government will put other idle resources to work. There'll be a multiplier effect. So it's a free lunch with a free dessert. Uh, not only does government spending rise, but private economic activity also goes up. Uh, so the creation of debt raises output. That's the message. Now. It's true that uh, there is a symmetrical proposition that if you're at full employment, you should be running a surplus. But in the Keynesian perspective, you're very, very seldom at full employment. Right? You can define potential output of the economy in such a way that, well, they've done it in the U.S. in such a way that I don't think we've been uh, at the potential level of output for a decade. Uh, 
And if, if your message is that, you know, nine years out of 10 or 99 years out of 100, uh, deficit spending is a free lunch, then it's unlikely that in the year of full employment, you're going to run a big enough surplus to offset that. So you're going to get chronic growth in uh, sovereign debt. Uh, so how do you get fiscal discipline? And I'll, I'll end on this, what I hope is a more optimistic note. <laughs> uh, there have been ways historically. Uh, some people have advocated sort of direct controls on spending and taxation. Uh, but under the gold standard, and this is a recent Nobel laureate, Tom Sargent, in an interview that he did before he got the Nobel Prize. He hasn't been quite this frank since he got the Nobel Prize. Uh, he says, look, uh, under the gold standard, if a country wanted to issue bonds, it was making a promise to repay in gold. Everybody knew it couldn't print gold. <laughs> so the bond buyers had to evaluate, is there really a plan to raise the tax revenue necessary to service and retire the debt? If yes, we'll buy the bonds. If no, we won't buy the bonds. And, you know, intermediately, if there's some chance, then we'll buy the bonds at a high interest rate. We'll demand a high yield on them. So uh, the way Sargent expresses this is the country had to balance its budget in a present value sense, which means not every year, but if you run a deficit, you have to be committed to run surpluses to pay back the debt you're incurring with interest uh, in the future. Why didn't this work in Europe? Why didn't this constrain Greece? Because like when it was on a gold standard, Greece could not print euros, right? Well, Turns out, we now know, <laughs> the European Central Bank is not like the gold standard. That is, the European Central Bank can print euros, and they can be prevailed upon to print euros, and they have been prevailed upon to print euros, to buy sovereign debt of the countries that are heavily indebted, uh, to lend money to banks collateralized by debt, uh, even though it was against their rules a couple of years ago to buy such low-rated debt. Uh, and even though they're not supposed to take instructions from the fiscal authorities, uh, the European Central Bank had a very nice constitution which committed them to just one goal, which was price stability. Nothing about bailing out, uh, helping out countries that can't pay their debts. Uh, it was okay until it came under stress, which of course is when you need a constitution and it seems to be crumbling. Uh, although the, the battle is still being fought uh, as to how much uh, they will get away from price stability. But this is my interpretation of the debt crisis in Europe. People were willing to lend Greece money much too much and much too cheaply because the European Union and the European Central Bank were behind it, at least implicitly. Of course, it turned out the debt was so large that they couldn't save everybody. The, the bondholders had to take a haircut. But it was reasonable for bondholders to think that they would be paid back even if Greece uh, couldn't pay them out of tax revenues. So we need to get the back to something like that. If not the gold standard, then something that equally constrains the fiscal authorities from running unlimitedly large deficits. Uh, and so maybe direct fiscal rules, or maybe a return to the gold standard. I wouldn't be against that, but of course it's a lot less likely. So I will stop here and uh, take questions. Thank you.